Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Michael. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I uh, like to thank Katya for asking me to speak here. Um, I my sobriety date is January twenty first of two thousand one. Um, to kind of give you an idea about rel- my relapse in my story, um, I had my first drink at age fourteen, uh, my first meeting at age sixteen, uh, and then I got sober at twenty three. So out of the nine years that I drank. Only two of them were without a knowledge of, uh, of AA. Um, although my first time, as you'll hear in a second, of trying to get, really get sober was 18. But um, between 18 and 23, uh, the most I ever had was 90 days. Um, and um, but uh, I um, originally uh, got sober, and I'm from uh, Houston, Texas. I've been in New York for uh, nine years now. Uh, well, as long as I drank, that's a long time. So, uh, in New York now. Uh, but, um, I, uh, had my first drink at 14. Uh, the consequences started pretty early. Um, uh, I didn't know anything about, you know, our, our book talks about the alcoholism being, uh, you know, the, the phenomenon of craving, craving, which means once I start, uh, it's almost impossible for me to stop. And the, the mental obsession, uh, makes it, very difficult to not take that first drink. Um, I didn't have the, really the mental obsession so much, but uh, and I couldn't have told you what a physical allergy was in the beginning, but uh, I definitely knew that once I started, it was almost impossible for, for me to stop, nor did I want to. Um, you know, my friends would say stuff like, I have a buzz, I'm good, uh, and that just didn't compete with me. Uh, I couldn't relate to that, and I just thought that no one liked alcohol as much as me. That was that was kind of how I could express the phenomenon of craving that early. Uh, uh, the consequences, there really weren't the second time I got in trouble uh, and blacked out the second time, too. I was a blackout drinker. Uh, one of the things I learned in rehab was that that's not normal. I just thought everyone blacked out when they drank. I you know, didn't know any better. Uh, and um, the consequences started uh, very early. I just could never not mess up. You know, um, it was always always out of town for breaking furniture. Uh, if I was at your house, something, some piece of furniture was probably going to get broken. Uh, wasn't the most graceful drunk either. Um, I, uh, you know, and I knew that I had no control once I started drinking. So my solution was not to drink less, which is what normal people would do. Uh, my solution was to try to isolate myself. Uh, so I just, I knew that I made an ass out of myself in public. So instead of not drinking, I just didn't go out in public anymore. Uh, or I tried not to go out in public. And so I would drink alone, uh, at home, uh, and then just try just to tell myself, don't go out. Uh, but inevitably I would get drunk and, uh, end up going out. Um, one of the kind of experiments I used to always try to do was, uh, I knew in my body that I was a different person once I took alcohol in my and to my system and that I didn't make uh, the judgments that um, I wish I could. So um, I decided that uh, to write uh, notes to myself when I, when I got drunk. So before I would start drinking, <laughs> I would write sticky notes and those little yellow sticky tabs and put them on different things. So I put one on the door first, do not go outside. Uh, and then I put another one on the phone, do not call this girl. Um, and then I would hide my shoes and my keys in my wallet before I drank. Um, but uh, inevitably, I would then just go outside without my shoes, my keys, or my wallet. Um, and I, for some reason, I was always had a talent of going out, get outside barefoot. I don't know why. I used to always want to make fun of those people on cops. You know, whenever they got arrested, it was like, just let me get my shoes. You know, and sure enough, when I get arrested, no shirt, no shoes. Um, and um, but. Um, so needless to say, it didn't work. Uh, all of my different uh, types of uh, trying to control the consequences without altering my drinking. Uh, I went to my first rehab, uh, my first meeting when I was 16. Uh, I had the unfortunate, unfortunate uh, uh, um, uh, to me it was unfortunate that my mom was dating someone in the program. Uh, so the signs uh, were, were, were fairly obvious, and she kind of knew a little bit. So she was going to Al-Anon. And so I went to this meeting when I was 16, extremely drunk. You know, I, I, my father was supposed to pick me up, and he found me outside uh, around the block from my house, passed out on the side of the street. 
um, no thought whatsoever uh, of how that might have looked to a father driving up on, on their child, being a parent now. Uh, it makes me shudder. But at the time, so he dragged me. My first meeting drunk, uh, extremely intoxicated, uh, would, would not be the last intoxicated meeting I would go to by far. Um, and I don't remember anything of what they said, uh, but I do remember uh, people welcoming me and telling me I was welcome. Uh, I chain smoked the whole time. Uh, wandered outside a few times and came back, but I do remember the hand uh, being held out to me there. Uh, and um, uh, it was a it was a meeting right next door to this sh- this kind of shelter, eight dollars uh, uh, a week, probably more now. But um, it was kind of a, a shelter place where where you could get sober, and the only requirements that you obviously you couldn't use and had to go uh, to two meetings a week, and the and the meeting house was next door. Uh, and I kind of looked around at this just room of kind of smoking people and thought that, you know, I have nothing whatsoever in common with these people, and uh, I'm not going to come back. Uh, five, six years later, I would actually be a resident of that facility, uh, but uh, at the time, uh, I walked out. Uh, the consequences started happening, the car wrecks. Luckily, uh, my higher power was just looking out for me. I never made it out. I was always too drunk to make it outside of the parking lot, so I ended up just crashing the car into certain objects and cars in the in the apartment complex. So thankfully, I never hurt anybody. Uh, um, and um, uh, I got arrested uh, for public uh, intoxication uh, and um, uh, arrested and 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 went into a uh, my first treatment uh, facility uh, when I was 18 years old. Uh, I stayed sober for 30 days out of spite, uh, I, which does not work, um, nor have I met anyone for whom that has worked. Uh, and because I didn't want to have anything to do with the God thing, uh, I didn't want to have uh, anything to do with the higher power, nor the steps, and I just kind of decided I would do it on my own. Uh, obviously, uh, that did not work out, and about 30 days later, uh, I drank. My first really serious time was when I was about 20 years old. Uh, and I stayed sober. I was all gung ho about. It. Stayed sober again, 30 days, uh, and uh, drank again. I did some steps. Uh, don't really remember how many I did, um, but um, I quickly went uh, quickly went out again. Um, in college, the consequences, same kind of pattern, would continue. Uh, eventually, uh, it got really bad, and I went to an inpatient rehab, same place actually as I had gone uh, four years before. Uh, and this time, I was gung-ho about it. I was Mr. Spirituality. I tell everyone how to have a better, higher power. I was praying like 18 hours a day, and uh, I was kind of the walking spiritual machine. Uh, and then everything was going great. And about 90 days later, uh, that feeling stopped, and I wasn't on the pink cloud anymore. And so I thought that somehow I had been betrayed like that was the deal i stopped drinking and god makes me feel spiritual 24 7 that's just how it works and so when that stopped uh i started drinking again Uh, and that's just what i did i kind of viewed god was my spiritual drug dealer and as long as i felt good uh, i wouldn't drink but if any like real life stuff should come across or i should stop feeling uh on a pink cloud uh, then I considered he had kind of backed out on his side of the bargain, uh, and I started drinking again. Uh, one of my favorite um, uh, lines from the, the literature, and I think it's in the 12 and 12, I just don't remember where, uh, but it talks about uh, going in alone in spiritual matters is dangerous. Uh, and I definitely wanted to do that. I wanted the relationship between me and God, but I didn't want to have anything to do with, with people in AA. Uh, or in meetings. So, uh, you know, I would go to this one meeting, smoking meeting, and sit behind the post so the speaker couldn't see me. It was no show. It was all call on people at the, where I got sober. Uh, and I didn't want to have anything to do. I would have a sponsor and, and work with him, but I didn't want to have anything to do with people or fellowship or anything like that. Uh, and uh, I can definitely say now how, you know, uh, that cutting off of that kind of spiritual feeling was definitely uh, the best thing my higher power could have done for me. Uh, because it meant that, um, you know, I had to, I had to look for God uh, among my fellow AA a members. Um, but I, um, <clears throat> uh, the process would just com- repeat over and over and over again. I would get sober, I would feel great, I'd be gung-ho about it, and then 90 days later, uh, almost on the day, uh, I would 
not feel good. Something wouldn't go my way, and, and I would drink again. And this process repeated uh, over and over and over again. Uh, I eventually went back to uh, that place where I had been to my first meeting uh, in the drunk room one time with the plastic <laughs> sheets, and uh, I managed to make a daring James Bond escape from this treatment center, which I found out the next day was a voluntary treatment center. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, went back and got all my stuff. The guy's like, I saw you running off. You just <laughs> and uh, I went back to that place and stayed there for another 90 days, and it's the same thing again and again and again. Um, but AA was always there. Uh, and then the last, you know, six months of my drinking, it was two days at a time. So I would get sober two days, come back for two days, get sober two, and it was just the, it, over and over and over again. Um, I relapsed when I was in that treatment place. And so instead of my sponsors, like, you need to tell them you relapsed. So I did the alcoholic thing and didn't tell them, but just moved out. And I found this, this apartment complex that was pretty shady and that I knew, uh, friends and family would probably not want to come over to at night. So I could just be kind of left alone, uh, and, and, and drink. Um, and so I would go on these long binges and, uh, it was right behind this taqueria. Uh, so every, you know, day when I needed to put some food in my system, I would kind of stumble over there drunk. Well, unfortunately for me, that was the after hour, after meeting hangout for all the, the meetings I used to go to. So I would go in there just, just completely wasted and see this group of AA people there, you know, uh, but they never, uh, pretended they didn't know me. You know, they always said hi. Uh, they would sometimes feel sorry for me and, uh, buy me dinner and listen to my long drunk logs about how, why AA wasn't working for me. Um, and, um, but I would also go to meetings. Uh, I would go to these meetings and I desperately wanted to get sober. Uh, but I also, uh, I couldn't stop drinking. You know, I went to many, many meetings drunk. Uh, and so that I've never, ever, uh, I've always been a big proponent of as long as you're not being disruptive. Uh, if you're drunk, come to a meeting, you know, uh, it definitely, um, it was, uh, a, a really a safe haven. I remember something I would, it would so bad. I would have to fill the coffee cups up uh, uh, halfway uh, because uh, my hands were shaking so bad that that's the only way I could hold the coffee uh, in, inside there. Uh, but AA was always there, and I was that guy who just like would, would, would everyone kind of saw walk back in the room like, oh, there, here he is again, you know. But the great thing was that no one let that alter how they 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 put, how how they made themselves available, you know. Uh, and that was that was huge, and, and I just I um, even took it for granted really uh, that AA would always um, uh, be there. Uh, and it got so bad one time I would call people over, I would have a bunch of booze, and I would put about three fourths of it uh, in my apartment somewhere. I would hide it, and I would call AA people to come over to my house to, to, to pour down my alcohol. Uh, down the drain for me uh, because I wanted to get sober. So they would come over and I would get to see my AA friends and they'd pour down. Everything's great. They'd leave and then I'd break out the alcohol again. Like I was so desperate for uh, companionship and for, and I wanted to be sober so bad, but I, uh, that I would have them do that. And they don't, I mean, they, it, amazingly, they, they still came. Uh, but every time they left, they said, he's going to drink again. They, yep, yeah. And, uh, uh, and I, I did. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, you know, I I used to think that there was, uh, and, you know, I'll talk about it a little bit at the very end, but um, I used to think that I knew what was different about the last time I got sober uh, in January 21st, 2001. Uh, but I honestly don't. I was in a kind of a near-death experience the, the night before, but I had had so many of those in the past. And it wasn't a fear thing. Uh, and it was kind of a quasi spiritual experience, but I had had those in the past as well. Uh, much greater strength, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, and, uh, it was, I'd been beaten down in the past, uh, but I was beaten down there, but I had also been beaten down in the past. So I can't really to this day put my finger on what was different. Um, but, uh, I, I started, uh, coming back again, uh, and, I can't overemphasize how important this was. Um, I had two friends who, one was a family member, my cousin, another, um, her best friend, who were in the program. Uh, and really just, I wasn't alone, really, those first, those first six months. Uh, uh, pretty much everywhere they went, uh, they took me, uh, with me. Uh, they took me with them. And, um, uh, that really, really saved my life. Um, ended up doing the steps again. I did know 
even though I couldn't put my finger on it, I knew something was different. Um, in those, in the meetings in Houston, they give away uh, chips for links to sobriety. Uh, I'm sure other places they do too. Um, and they had this one called the Desire Chip, right? The little white plastic ones. Uh, and they would give those up every time you would uh, come back again. And I had like 30 of those things in my apartment. I mean, I used to, because all when I would go to the meetings, the guys knew me there. And when they would say, does anyone want a desire chip? And I would put, look down in my head. My friends would go, yeah, right here. He wants one. Yeah, he's going to come up right there. Uh, and so I came up and I just got, I had like, those, they were everywhere in my apartment. And I don't know what it was, but I just kind of knew something was different this time. And so I actually brought it when I was at my grandma's. I, I w went, I knew I had put it in a box somewhere. And I took my keys and under the recovery, I made a giant scratch. And the reason I did this is so I could tell this one from like the gazillions of others that I had uh, in my apartment. Uh, and um, actually, I, I can't believe I still have it, but uh, it's a big, can't see the key mark. But uh, uh, I made a big scratch so I could tell because I just kind of knew something uh, was different. Um, and, you know, I, I used to, like I was said earlier, I used to think, and I think I actually, I don't quite remember, uh, but I think when I was about two and a half years, I, I, when I went to the Portland Iggy Paul, I spoke on a panel, and I think it was about relapse or something. So it'd be very interesting to see, like, what my magic formula was that I said at that time uh, to that to never relapse again. Uh, because I really don't, and for a long time, it was always something different, you know, and, 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 uh, but today I just don't know. But the one thing that when I was trying to think about what I could say that I guess my message is, uh, is the other side of it. The one thing that was there the entire time, what was so crucial is that when it finally something did happen, AA was still there. Uh, and that was, you know, that, that, that only thing that I remember, uh, from my first meeting was that guy, sticking out his hand to me and, and telling me welcome, you know, uh, nothing else. Uh, the time and time and time again that I came back in the rooms when I was drunk in the rooms, uh, when, you know, uh, people had no right to think I would get sober, nor was I offended that they, that they didn't think I was going to get sober. Uh, they were still there. So even though they thought I was full of crap, when I called, they still picked up the phone. Uh, and I do that to this day. There's been so many times, especially in early sobriety, where some a sponsee would call and I just didn't want to do it. And then about, you know, a ring before I knew my message machine would pick up, uh, I would remember those people who picked up the phone when I called them uh, when I was going through that. Uh, and I always picked up. Uh, and so that's really... Um, my message is not so much, I wish I had some kind of secret thing for how I stopped relapsing and got sober, uh, but really it's just one of gratitude that when it, I finally did get sober, AA was there, you know, and, and that is just so, so crucial to me, uh, and I try to be that person now uh, that was there for me uh, in the beginning, because uh, eventually, you know, the, the, the chronic relapser, and it's amazing, my higher power uh, put, put one in my life, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, um, you know, do I think he's going to get sober soon? Nope. But that doesn't in the least change uh, the way I'm going to be available for when he calls, um, or even now, you know. And um, that's just, uh, it's, it's one of those things that's been just kind of imprinted on my sobriety now, uh, of being there for that person, because I never know uh, when it's going to happen. Uh, and uh, I'm so grateful that AA never, ever, ever turned their back on me, never told me that I wasn't welcome or that I couldn't come back, and really AA was uh, was there when I came back because if when I finally, you know, this last sober date, uh, if those people had not been there, I don't know if that would have been uh, the last time, you know, and uh, I don't even like to think about what would happen if there's no AA uh, uh, now, so um, it really is um, one of the you know the only message I have uh, about relapsing is uh, try to stay sober. So when that person who keeps relapsing comes through the door, uh, you're there to to help that person. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. thank you, Michael. Um, you know, one thing I kept thinking about while you were speaking was the crazy things that we used to do when we were drunk to, like, trick ourselves. 
I used to like not want to text somebody specific and then I got into the habit when I was drunk deleting the text so I would think that I didn't actually do it. Like we would come up with these crazy like brilliant ideas that uh, that th this time it's going to be different, you know, because of the blackouts and I too didn't realize that blackouts were not we're not normal. I really thought that, you know, everybody drank like me and it, it, it's so funny. You get sober and you learn so much about this disease. And I think for me, at least, um, the knowledge of the disease is definitely what has kept me, you know, coming around and, and what kind of drew me in from the beginning because I felt like I belonged somewhere. Um, so excellent. Our next speaker is Tom from Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Tom. Hi, Tom. And my spray date is November 2nd, 2007. I have a home group of sponsor and I have the privilege of being a sponsor. Um, obviously, 2007 is not my first spray date. Um, <laughs> talking about the topic we're talking about. I, uh, I first got sober back on August 6, 1998. Leading up to that point, as, as most of you know from your own experience, I went through hell. I was a late bloomer. I started drinking when I was 16. Um, it was my first first time drunk. I uh, grabbed a bottle of what I lovingly call to kill you and uh, <laughs> finished off half a fifth of that and immediate blackout. Evidently went into the, the liquor cabinet, got a bottle of sherry, got halfway through that before uh, well before I busted that into the bathroom and then, uh, just proceeded to make a, a mess of everything. I, uh, I came to the next day about three o'clock, and um, I had glass in my face and my hands and, and uh, just just a mess. And, um, and I told myself, this is not a good thing. This is not a good thing. Alcoholism um, does run in my family. Um, my father's a sober member. My stepmother's a sober member. My brother's a sober member. My grandfather died from this. And, um, and so I knew that me drinking probably was not the smartest thing. But that didn't matter. Because what alcohol does for me, within a couple of shots, it gives me that... I can breathe. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's all right with the world. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter how I'm feeling beforehand, where I'm at, who I'm with. A couple of shots... I am straight. I'm good. And, uh, and I'm like, uh, I always like Willy, Willy Wonka's line, candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. And um, <laughs> when I started drinking, the only reason for me to drink was to get drunk. That was it. I didn't decide to go out and just have a couple and socialize. It was always, I want to get it in me as quickly as possible so I can get that relief I'm looking for. And I chased that for years. I chased that for years. And for most, most of the time, I got it. Um, the second time I drank was not as bad as the first, so I thought, okay, it was just a bad night. No worries. We're going to go with this. And, um, and I drank probably for about five years. I'm just about five years. I, uh, I went to college a couple places, went up to Seattle to get as far away from the parents as possible. Um, ran out of money, went back to San Diego. And uh, went up and down the, the West Coast for a while. At, at, at one point, when I dropped out of college, I was actually, I thought I was just camping. But I was later told I was homeless. <laughs> I, was, uh, I, was I was living on the floor of uh, Yosemite Valley and, uh, for about three months. And, and, and this, my life at this point was, I would get up in the morning, start collecting cans, turn them in so I could have drinking money for that night, Ask somebody to buy me some dinner and do the same thing the next day. Just over and over and over again. And eventually that got old. Actually, it started getting cold. And um, I made my way, my way back to San Diego and uh, met her. There's, there's always a her. <laughs> she moved to Arizona, so I moved to Arizona for a couple weeks, and that wasn't working out. So I, uh, I made my way back out, back, back out east um, where I met another her which ended badly. And at this point, I am 22 years old. I'm a college dropout. 
my life has gotten so small that I'm, I'm tending bar two blocks from where I'm living. There's a bar a block in between me and, my, and where I work. So I'd go to work, close out that bar, go to my home bar, close that out, get up the next morning and do it all over again. My whole world was a three-block radius. And I cared. It's not that I didn't have feelings. It's not that I didn't know that this was not good. I just felt helpless to do anything about it. It's just what it was. was, It's the only only thing I knew, so it was the only thing I I was capable of doing. So what I ended up doing after that, that relationship ended badly is I wanted to kill somebody and I wanted to die. So I joined the army, thinking they would be able to, you know, at least train me how to kill somebody in the process. Maybe I'll catch a bullet. And uh, I did really well. I did really good um, for a couple of months. I mean, I, you take alcohol out of me, and I, I sign up pretty good pretty quick, um, especially if I'd have no chance of getting alcohol, which was what was going on. I got, you know, promoted up to squad leader, platoon guide, most professional soldier in my platoon. And um, I'm getting ready to go to Bosnia, and the, the day I graduate, they give me a three-day pass. I went to the bar, two counties over, because the place I'm, I was uh, Fort Knox, Dry County. And um, so I went two counties over to the bar. And I came to the next day on a Greyhound bus bound for San Diego. See, when, when I drink, I have no control over what I'm going to do. It doesn't matter what the consequences are. It really doesn't. Without the solution that's outlined in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I am doomed to continue drinking. I'm an alcoholic. It's what I am. It's what I'm going to do. And so when I uh, when I finally got out of the army, I was 90 pounds in '98. I will always be a thin man. I know, but I was a wraith. Um, and I uh, I reached out to the one person I knew had found a solution, and that was my father. And he 12 stepped me started taking me to meetings, and he, um, he showed me what it was like to live sober. He told me, if I'm an alcoholic, I'm a liar, I'm a cheat, I'm a thief, and I need a sponsor, and he cannot be it. And so I knew at that point that, is this better? So I knew at that point that, that was important. He, uh, he provided me with some tools, and he, and he dropped me off, and I... Uh, and I fell into an active group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now I was pretty burnt when I first came around back in 98. I, uh, I really had a hard time putting two sentences together in, in a coherent sequence. I could not um, formulate my ideas real well. And I was just, I was a burnt cookie. It was not pretty. And, and by the time I realized that I was an alcoholic, by the time that, that really settled in on me, um, I was in the middle of the solution. I was doing what I hear all the time in Alcoholics Anonymous, what the deal is. Go to meetings, get a sponsor, get service, try to help the next guy. And um, and I was doing it. And my life got really good. My life got really good. Not only was I uh, comfortable once again, because for me, Alcoholics Anonymous does the exact same thing that those three shots of whiskey does. It gives me that, it's okay. It's going to be all right. It doesn't matter where I am, who I'm with, or what my circumstances are. If I'm applying these steps in my life and I'm attending Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, I get the same exact result that I got from alcohol, which is, for me, phenomenal. This is the only solution I have now that's viable. I, um, I was sober for nine years. I had, uh, I had people I was sponsoring. I was, you know, like I said, I was doing service. Um, I got a lot of gifts in Alcoholics Anonymous. One time I had the American dream, you know. I found her again. We got married. I had a dog, the house, the cars. I had the job that was flying me all across the U.S. and Canada. And I let those things get in the way. My primary, my primary uh, purpose shifted. It shifted from Alcoholics Anonymous to what I got and how can I get more. And um, luckily at that time in 2005, um, I woke up to the fact that this was going on. I came home one day um, from a business trip, looked at the wife, looked at the dog, looked at the condo, looked at my bank account, so I had enough money to get to Amsterdam and have a really good weekend. And that scared me. 
and that scared me. <laughs> and um, and I got honest with my sponsor, and I started working the steps. Um, because of the actions I had been taking as a dry drunk, I lost all those things in my life, but I was able to stay sober. I was able to stay sober through that divorce. I was able to stay sober through, you know, selling the condo, splitting up the money, giving away the dog, all of that. What happened at that point, though, and this is really where my relapse started, is I stopped praying. I stopped trying to improve that conscious contact with my higher power. And um, I did a little geographic down to Georgia, and um, and things were uh, things were really good. I got plugged in right away. I started sponsoring people. I had service commitments. Um, I was doing all the things I had been taught. I talked to my sponsor every day. Um, and then I got a job that wanted me to work 70, 80 hours a week. Um, and I was like, all right, well, I'll do it until I get something else. And um, and slowly over time, I had to stop sponsoring the guys I was sponsoring because I wasn't showing up to the meetings where I was telling them to show up at because I was working so much. And so I had to drop my service commitments because I can't make it to all these meetings. And then... I'm really tired. I I need to sleep. I just I just need a night off. And um and slowly over time I stopped doing all the things I had been taught. Um and I didn't even notice what was going on. Like I said, I'd probably stopped praying at that point probably a half a year before. Within nine months of uh moving down to Georgia, I got another job finally. And I was uh, working in uh, Savannah, and I'm living in Brunswick, Georgia, which is right on the coast, just north of Jacksonville. And it's a long drive. Now, where I'm from, driving an hour is no big deal to go to work, right? It's 30 miles in D.C., okay? In Georgia, it's 80 miles. So I'm getting really worn out. And I have this thought. I'm like, well, I really need to move to Savannah. And um, and my next thought was, you know, if you move to Savannah, you're going to drink. And that was it. There was no, hey, dumbass, you remember the last 12 years of your life? Do you remember the fact that you've been sober now for nine years? Do you remember why you came to Alcoholics Anonymous in the first place? There was absolutely nothing, because I had lost that conscious contact with my higher power. There's absolutely nothing standing in the way of me in that dream. My next thought was, hmm, I guess I'm going to drink. And that's what happened. And it started off pretty slow. The first night I had a couple beers, got a, got a buzz. No big deal. But within that week, I was drinking every day. And within that month, I'm drinking around the clock. And um, two months of that, two months of a straight whiskey diet will do a lot of damage. It will do a lot of damage. The first time I was out there, I was a blackout drinker. I was not so lucky this time. I got to remember and feel everything I said and did. And that was hell. Because although I was physically getting drunk, and I was getting some very temporary relief. You people fucked me up with what you were saying it means. <laughs> you guys really screwed up my drinking. And uh, actually, one of the first things I did when I started drinking was I erased all my MP3s, threw out all my tapes, because I did not want to have any, any more reminder than I already had. So about two months into that, I'm uh, if I don't have a drink every two or three hours, I start to convulse. Um, the DTs are bad. I'm uh, I'm dying from alcohol, bro. And uh, and my sponsor calls. And I don't know about you, but when I'm drinking a couple of fists of whiskey a day, and my sponsor calls, I let that go to voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll check that one later. And um, and I did check it. And um, and here's you know, talks about it in the book. You know, here's a jumping off place. I know I can't drink. I can't keep doing this because I'm destroying myself. You know, I'm spiritually dead. I'm, I'm dying physically. Um, morally, I'm, I'm completely bankrupt, right? But I can't stop drinking because I'm going to die from the alcohol withdrawal. What the hell do you do? You know, what do you do? So I said that prayer that I said the first time I got sober. Um, at one point, it's really easy to get on your knees and pray when you're convulsing on your living room floor. Just your knees is the next point to stand in on. And, um, and so I stopped there on my knees, and I, I just said, help. And, uh, and I picked up the phone, and I called my sponsor. And I told him exactly what had been going on. 
And when I got off the phone with him, I'm sitting out on the back porch smoking a cigarette, and my bartender, who actually lived below me, <laughs> came out to walk her dog. And, um, and she asked me what was going on. So I told her basically everything I just told you, right? From when I started drinking up to that point. And she asked. And uh, <laughs> so, so I tell her, and she looks me dead in the eye, and she says, I know somebody in the program. Do you want me to have him give you a call? I need no further proof that my higher power works in my life. My bartender got me back into the room to talk about this. Straight up. And, um, and sure enough, this guy came over, and uh, he had three months. And he took me to a meeting, and at the end of that meeting, I'm, I'm falling to pieces. I mean, I'm, I'm starting to foam at the mouth, I'm shaking, and it's Halloween night in Savannah. And there's no way he's getting me into a detox Halloween night in Savannah. So he took me back to my house, and he sat with me at my kitchen table while I drank the night through so I wouldn't die in my sleep, and we talked the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I told him my story, he told me his story. We talked about the joy that we found in these rooms. We talked about the fact that if we practice these principles, the state I was in is impossible to repeat. I practice these steps in my life. I try to do this as a way of life. And, um, and I, I went to the detox the next day, and I was separated from alcohol for hopefully the last time. And, um, and I moved back up to D.C., and I got right back in the middle. There was no other choice for me. For me, I have to live this on a daily basis, or I am a dead man. Straight up. Um, there, there's no other. i got two solutions in this world. One is alcohol, and one is Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not going to live long on alcohol. It's not going to work. Um, I got right back into the steps. I did work through the steps again with my sponsor. I was actually um, six months sober. Again, my higher power is working on my life, and I'm, I was... Uh, I was blessed to be offered a position to work on my inner group. And I took an assistant position there, and six months later I took the, uh, the manager's position. My entire life is Alcoholics Anonymous. And for me, that's the only way to do it. That's the only way I can guarantee my sobriety, is if I start in the morning by asking for help. Throughout the day, I continue to ask for help and try to help, help somebody else. Um, you know, I, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I cannot describe the difference between my first sobriety when I was working a program and my sobriety now. Um, it's on a completely different plane. It is on a completely different plane. This is not to say that if I stop praying, I stop working these steps, I stop trying to help somebody else, I know for a fact I will drink again. That experience I just told you about, that relapse and that, that recovery and what I'm even doing now in my life is not a shield against that. It's what am I doing today? What am I doing today? Am I trying to practice these principles in all my affairs? And believe me, trying to practice these principles in all my affairs, especially the 12th tradition, that last part, principles before personalities, try doing that in a relationship. That's not fun. It's not fun, but... It's what's got to happen, you know? It's, it's, it's what we have to do here. I have been shown and given a way of life that is beyond explanation. You know, I can't draw in a straight line from where I started out when I was 16 to where I am now, 35. The only explanation for me today is that there is a higher power that is active in my life because I'm active in it. That's it. That's it. When we talk about in the, in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, its whole purpose is to bring us into conscious contact with a higher power that can relieve our alcoholism and solve all our problems. And, um, and so every day, I start my day thanking the higher power. I don't try to figure it out. I, it could be the force for all I know. I just ask it for help, and I thank it, and I just try to do the next right thing. And, um, and really for me, that's, that has been probably the hardest principle in this program. Because, see, I'm a perfectionist with an inferiority complex. So if I know I can't do it right, I'm not going to bother 
I'm not even going to bother trying. But what you all have shown me is if I just try to take the next right action, if I just, if I just suit, suit up and show up and put my hand out there, I got a chance. I got a chance. And, um, and I love you all, and I thank you for my sobriety. And I want to thank the, uh, the committee for asking me to come out here and be a part of this. This has been a great weekend so far. I'm looking forward to the rest of it. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, you know, you touched on a lot of things that I definitely could relate to. First, that geographical cure, which I didn't even real- realize until I got into the rooms. You know, I moved from New Jersey to New York, and I thought, okay, this is it. Like, I'm good. I, nobody knows me here, and and uh, I can drink the way I want to, and no one's going to judge me. And that, that clearly did not work out. Um, and thinking that being homeless is acceptable. I'm right there with you. I don't know who I thought I was, but I, I thought that this was normal, you know, to be drinking and drugging and in Newark by myself, you know, things like that, that we're just, you know, walking around and, and so caught up in, in the disease that you don't even, you don't even know what's right from wrong. And, and I love what you said about trying to not figure it out. And I think, you know, for me, the gift of desperation is, is the biggest gift that I've got gotten out of this program. Um, you know, it's a simple program for complicated people, as my sponsor has told me. And the best thing that's been able to help me is that, you know, I give up. I really just give up. Um, and I'll do anything that you guys tell me to do and I'm not going to try and figure it out. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring up our last speaker, which is Raina and she's here from Detroit, Michigan. Hi, my name is Raina. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I have to time myself because um, <clears throat> my first open talk was an hour and uh, 10 minutes. And um, I was really offended when people started getting up and walking out at an hour. Because <laughs> I, I, um, I was just about to complete talking about my drinking and uh, <laughs> get to the good stuff. And they walked out. So it's fine. It doesn't hurt that much, though. Um, <laughs> I really don't want to be here, and I don't want to speak at all. And um, I really like attention, but I, more than liking attention, I dislike telling the truth. I mean, honestly and sincerely, I dislike telling the truth. I I don't want to stand in front of a group of people and tell the truth. Um, I, I would rather be cute and funny and um, never let any of you know me. And that's the way I am. After years of sobriety, I still don't feel comfortable doing it. I don't, and, and, and I, I just don't want to. And, um, I, you know, I recoil at the idea of being vulnerable. And so um, here I am. And Katya told me, okay, she asked me to speak, and I didn't ask her what I was talking about. I just said yes. And, um, and then she, uh, she told me she would try to be here to hear me speak because I told her I really didn't want to speak. And then she left a finger puppet because if she didn't get back in time, I could talk to the llama or goat. I'm not sure what it is. So thanks for having me here, Katya. That's great. Um, I, uh, I know, right? I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I was 14 years old, and uh, it was uh, April 4th of 1998. And um, I really didn't want to be in AA, but I wasn't, I wasn't really sure if I was crazy or not. Um, but I knew that the drinking was a problem. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't sure if, if it was the drinking or, or some of the outside issues that I had going on, but, but it, it was a problem. And uh, people around me were dying, and I, somewhere in the back of my head, kept thinking, like, I'm 14, like, this can't really be happening. But um, I was blessed in that um, I knew that Alcoholics Anonymous existed. Uh, my father before he uh, died, was a member of AA. And, uh, and so I knew AA involved pig roast, uh, motor- motorcycle groups, and um, dances. I wasn't really sure how you guys stayed sober, but I knew that you didn't drink. And, uh, and so I came to AA not really liking pig roast, um, but I like dancing, so I thought AA is really going to help me. And, um, and I kind of hung out in AA for a few years, you know. I spent like two and a half years. That's not true. <laughs> I came to AA. Can I move this closer to me? I feel it's very far away. Okay. I came to AA and uh, 
I I was told very early on that I needed a sponsor, so I found someone that I didn't think would. Uh, well, I asked her if she'd work the steps, and she said, no, not really, but I'm trying, and I thought, you're perfect. And um, they really didn't want to do a lot. And then later on, I was told that um, if you do service, you'll stay sober. So I immediately got on a young people's committee and um, like just tried to just be the annoying girl in the meeting, uh, the business meeting. And so I did that for a couple of years until finally um, the the not drinking in, in the – and the living in my own skin became absolutely unbearable. And um, I, at that time, I was I was 16 years old, and I was I was really still pretty scared of drinking. And I I'd been around AA for long enough that I'd heard enough stuff that I thought maybe I should really give the steps like a serious try. Like I mean, okay, so my first fourth step after I got done reading it, um, and my sponsor didn't say anything. We then ripped it up. We should have, I mean, at the time, I didn't know that you, you, you need that to, like, your bliss, the people to make amends to, like, you're going to need your fourth step. But she wasn't on that step yet, so we didn't know what we were doing. And so <laughs> I, I thought maybe I'll find, I'll find, like, a real sponsor who's actually done the steps first, and then we'll do them together. So that's where I was at two and a half years sober, and I decided to, to get a real sponsor. And, um, and honestly, I was requested by the people that I was, um, trying to do service with that I get, I finally get a real sponsor and, um, stop making up the stuff she was telling me because they didn't believe that people would say that. So I got, I got a real sponsor and, um, and I worked the steps and, and, and I was in love with Alcoholics Anonymous, absolutely in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I spent a few years, I mean, we were just, we were hanging out, AA and I, and, um, I was going to young people's and I was, I was, going to all these meetings and I was, you know, I no more than one a day though, cause newcomers do two a day and they're crazy. So I was only going to one a day and, um, you know, I, I loved AA and I was happy and I was bubbly and, and I loved Alcoholics Anonymous. And then, um, what happened was people started giving me the suggestions and, and I don't know, somewhere in there it shifted because this, I got this attitude. Well, I've been sober since I was 14 and I think I know how to do this. I'm pretty sure. Uh, you were old when you got sober and, uh, being young when you get sober, it's like you live this, you know, you didn't, you live it and it becomes a part of you. So I'm pretty sure I don't need you to tell me what to do. <laughs> uh, I decided, um, when I was 18, I was in college, I graduated sober, I graduated high school sober, went through all of high school sober and graduated sober and decided that I was going to go to college and um, be Ernest Hemingway. Oh, I talked to the little llama goat guy, but I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> okay, so um, I uh, I decided after my first semester of college um, that I should drop out of my car or drop out of college, move into my car, and just live in my car. I was three and a half years sober. And, um, and I did it. And you know what? I got to be really honest. It was a great decision. It was an absolutely fantastic decision at the time that I made it. Um, any of you that are thinking about moving into your car, I highly recommend it. It's like a amazing process of self-discovery. I, um, I started driving around the country, going to young people's conventions and, uh, sleeping on AA people's couches. I had this absolutely fantastic time. I wasn't exactly being responsible, but I was sober in AA and, and, and absolutely loving being sober and, and being 18. And um, and then I decided to start backpacking internationally, and that went really, really well for me. Until um, one day I was sitting in the belly of Mexico looking out over the Pacific Ocean, and for no absolutely no reason, um, the thought occurred to me that maybe I wasn't really alcoholic because there were things that I hadn't really told people my first five years that I was here, like there were things that um, happened that I did and that I was a part of that um, when I was drinking that I just really didn't know how to tell someone, even though we have a fourth step and we have a fifth step and, and I just really didn't know how to tell people. And I didn't really know how I felt about those things. And um, I just didn't know how to get right with, with it. You know, I just, I, I couldn't even wrap my brain around it. And, and, and like, I kept having these thoughts that were coming up about it and I would get really upset and I would get emotional and worked up about them. But then I would think to myself, like, I can't explain this to you guys because you like me now, now that I've worked the steps, kind of, you like me now. And, um, I don't really want to tell you, I don't. And, and I've always had this like relationship with myself where I'm 
pretty much unworthy of any sort of love, care, affection. And um, if you treat me poorly, I'll like you a lot, though. And um, so <clears throat> I'm sitting in the belly of Mexico, and the thought occurs to me that maybe I'm not really alcoholic. And, and I knew, though, because um, I had been sober since I was 14. I've told you how I felt about that, that I was vastly superior. Um <laughs> That maybe there was, there was something wrong with my thinking about this whole not being an alcoholic thing. Because I could relate to the drinking, especially the breaking the furniture, love that. Repeatedly broke entertainment centers by like accidentally falling into them. And people were so upset about that. <laughs> like I just felt that they just had this ridiculous response to me breaking their furniture. It was an accident. Um, and other things, you know, like I couldn't really drink orange juice because I used it as a mixer for so long that I just couldn't stomach the taste of orange juice when I got sober. But those things, I was like, no, 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 I'm different. I'm different because I'm, I'm different. And I had all of these reasons why I was different. I had these things that had happened in my childhood, and I had things that had happened when I was drinking, and that made me different. And um, I didn't want to talk about them in AA. And, and um, so when I had the thought that maybe I'm not an alcoholic, and I had all this pride, and I had so much pride, so much pride, that um, there was only a few people that I was willing to call and tell the truth to, and they were the people that didn't really work the steps in AA because they didn't intimidate me because the people that read the big book and worked the steps in AA kind of intimidated me. They made me a little nervous. Um, and so I... Um, I found I, I I came up with this idea to call one person and uh, she didn't answer her phone and I figured well you know I tried I tried really hard <laughs> yeah uh, and at five years and one month I drank and I cried about it I want I think that's very important I was gonna miss all of you which will be which will come up with my current life experience because I was gonna miss all of you even though I didn't like you. And um, couldn't really relate to you. I was going to miss you. So uh, I drank. And uh, I stayed drunk for a few weeks. And things went really poorly. Um, as um, Well, the first night I got drunk involved a situation with the Federales. And then we had to bury the drugs and leave immediately. That was the beginning of, like, my re-entry back into drinking. But I figured, you know what? Mexico, whatever. Not really such a good place. A little stringent. Like, let's go to Guatemala. And um, <laughs> it went poorly, guys. Like, it just went poorly. And I ended up um, I ended up in this hostel. They wanted to kick me out because I kept flushing the toilet after they turned off the electricity, which was apparently backing up their whole system, which I was like, you're overreacting. Um, <laughs> raw sewage is nothing to be that concerned about. <laughs> I ended up on my knees begging God. To, to get sober again. Um, I was stuck in this village and I wasn't really sure how to get out and I wasn't really sure the village that I was in and um, I didn't know how I'd, I'd gotten there at 19 years old after I'd spent five years in AA. Like I couldn't figure out how I got drunk and how I was in this village and, and, and I remember thinking, you know, if I drank myself to death down here, um, I don't think the people back home would know. Like, I don't think they would ever know what happened to me. Like, I could drop off the face of the earth, and I don't think they would know what happened to me. And, um, like, how did I go from being a good girl in AA that did all of her step work and um, sponsored and helped people to, like, drinking? You know, like, how does that happen? And, and, like, the problem was I had so much AA in my head, and I had so much guilt that, like, I couldn't even drink enough to block it out. Like, that's the truth. Like, I couldn't drink enough to block out my conscious contact with God. Couldn't do it. And, and like, I never thought that that would be possible, that I could hear God while drunk. But there I am, drunk, missing AA, missing all these people that I didn't want to tell the truth to. And it sucked. It sucked really, really bad. And so I begged God to let me come back to AA. And I remember telling God, but if I could come back to AA, I knew that it wasn't like a faucet that I could turn on and off and I would stay in AA and I would do the step work, like really honestly do the step work and I would, I would do service. And you know, there's this, there's a friend of mine in AA and he talks about not being a thief in Alcoholics Anonymous, that AA gives you this life and do not just take it and not give back to AA. And I, I remember thinking that I didn't want to be a thief in Alcoholics Anonymous. Like I want to give back to AA for the life that it's given me. So somewhere between um, Guatemala, this prayer, 
in a water taxi that I took out of the village. I got sober. By sober, I mean I stopped drinking. I came back to the United States, and I remember I had this great resolve while I was in, I flew into Chicago, and at some point in customs, I remember in my head saying to myself, like, I'm going to tell everyone the truth when I get back to Detroit. Like, I'm going to tell everyone the truth when I get back to Detroit. The problem was um, somewhere over, like, Michigan, flying back into Detroit, I started thinking that there was this camp out, this young people's camp out that happened every July, and I was flying back just in time for it, and I didn't really, like, I wanted to go with this guy, and I knew that he wouldn't go with me if I had less than a year, because I'd have to hang out with the women, and so I didn't, maybe after the camp out, I would tell everyone that I drank, because I didn't want to have less than a year. <laughs> And then we made eyeballs at each other at the camp out, and I knew we were going to get back together. And he had been sober like seven or eight or nine years or something like that at the time. And I thought, you know, like he wouldn't be so bad to marry. But he probably won't marry me if I'm a newcomer. Maybe I should buy a house if I'm going to do the staying sober thing. <laughs> I got married and bought a house. I took my six-year token... I took my seven-year token, and then I had a bright light spiritual experience where God came up and drop kicked me in the stomach. It hurt <laughs> really bad. And then one day, it was Thanksgiving, I decided that I couldn't hide out in Al Alcoholics Anonymous anymore. Like, I had this thought that told me that I had to tell the truth no matter what. Like, I had to get up and tell the truth in front of everybody, no matter what, no matter how I felt about it. Even if I was telling all of you that I wasn't really worthy of your love, care, and affection, that um, I had drank because I was terrified of drinking again, which was not something that I wanted to do. I had to go to the women that I sponsored at the time and tell them, you know what? I haven't really been sober seven years. I've been sober two years. And it was one of the most painful experiences I've ever had. I stood up in front of groups where I took treasury positions that required a definite amount of sobriety, and I told them that I had lied about my sobriety day. I didn't want to be a newcomer again in AA. I clung to my pride so much. I am... So prideful, I will tell you how prideful I am. I want to be the most prideful girl in the room. That's how prideful I am. It's crazy. It's crazy the things that I come up with. But when I don't write an inventory, I come up with these solutions in my head as to how I should live life and the way it's going to look. Like, I think I should, my alcoholism, I think to myself, I'm not drinking, so it's okay to marry someone in AA and buy a house and not tell them that I drank a few weeks ago. And here's the deal about how great of a liar I am. Nobody knew I drank. Nobody knew I drank for years. And I was the only one. I was the only one that knew that I had really drank. Like, I mean, seriously, guys. Like, I have gone to everybody and told them that I drank. And everyone was like, really? We didn't really think you Wow. So... When I, when I put all this value on how you guys see me, the truth of the matter is, is like the relationship between me and God is what was most important, you know? And like, I couldn't trust God and I couldn't be honest with myself. And I ran around in AA absolutely dry drunk, absolutely dry drunk. And, um, you know, from that point forward, I, I, um, there was a woman, she's, she's my service sponsor now. Her name's Christine. And, um, from that point forward, um, I promised Christine that I would tell the truth no matter what. I was like, I'm going to tell the truth no matter what because I'm absolutely terrified of drinking again. Because what I've learned is that drinking doesn't give me that sense of release that it gave me. It doesn't. Like, I can have a head full of God, full of God and full of AA, right? And I want to say something about this God thing. I only say God because it's convenient. I view myself um, slightly Christian. I really like some of the Jewish beliefs. I love the Hindu religion. I'm a big, big, huge fan. Um, you know, like, I mean, it's all a mix in there. I was dating this Muslim guy for a while. That looks really nice. Um, so I say God because it's convenient, you know, but really it's just like a collective consciousness of the spirit. And, and um, when I hide out from God, 
and I hide out for myself by not doing inventory work and, and when I hide out in Alcoholics Anonymous because I can do it. And I, and I've been doing it for the last, uh, okay, November of last year. I've been doing it since November of last year where like, um, I've slowly, slowly got my sponsorship down to where I'm only sponsoring a couple women. And, uh, I go to service meetings and I don't really like going to regular meetings because people are whiny and, um, I want to shake them. And, um, I've gotten to the point where, um, I've started thinking that, you know, maybe I don't need to be in AA anymore. Like maybe, maybe I'll just not drink and not go to meetings and, uh, maybe I'll get married again. I've been thinking about buying a house. <laughs> like I will seriously find any other solution other than working the 12 steps and working with other alcoholics to stay sober. Like I will do it because, and I tell myself that maybe it's okay. You know, like maybe it's okay. Maybe I can just live this existence of not really being fully happy. But here's the deal. I have this relationship with God, which I can't escape, cannot escape it. I don't know about you guys. Maybe you can, but from what I've heard, even if you like drink to try to get away from yourself and God, it doesn't work. That's just what I've gathered from AA meetings so far. Like, <clears throat> I don't want to be that person who is absolutely unhappy in AA. Like, I don't want to be that person anymore. And I don't want to be the person that um, ends up in the belly of Mexico crying because I'm going to miss AA when the truth of the matter is, is like, AA is there. Like, AA is there. It's in Mexico. I don't know if you guys knew this. It's worldwide. It's crazy. But it's... <laughs> It's in Mexico, and, 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 and I get these ideas and these beliefs in my head about who I am and about who I have to be in AA, and the truth of the matter is, is like, I'm just as new as I, as I was the day that I got honest with everybody about drinking, and, and, and I'm just as new as the f first meeting that I went to when I was 14 years old and absolutely terrified and not sure if I was alcoholic. Like, I'm just as new today. And, and I don't like to remain that teachable and I don't like to remain that open. I'd rather be seen as a guru of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is funny. I said that to someone outside of AA one time, my friend Jillian, she's a nurse and we were having this conversation and I was trying to explain AA to her and I was like, she's like, well, are you like, you know, like what, what okay, so you're sober for a few years and you still do this AA thing. She's like, how does that really go for you? Like, do people really look up to you? And I was like, I don't know if they really look up to me. I'm not really sure. And she's like, I don't know if I'd really want to be like the best alcoholic of all alcoholics, Raina. <laughs> like, in the way she said it, I was like, maybe I don't want to be. Like, maybe I don't want to be the leader AA in all of AA, but maybe I secretly do. <laughs> um, my relationship with AA, um, it, it changes, it varies. Like, it changes from year to year. And I, I get this idea sometimes that um, because I've been sober for a little while that, that I know more and, and really, honestly, like, um, I've had bright light spiritual experiences and I've had spiritual experiences of the educational variety. And this is what I've learned. I don't really know. I don't really know. I, I don't really know. I just know that I don't want to drink today. And, and, and what's happened lately is that I don't really love AA. And so I've started dedicating meetings to various members of AA. Like to, for example, Tuesday I went to this meeting for Christine who has loved me through all of my sobriety since I was 14 years old and absolutely insane through every single business meeting where I wanted to call point of order, even when there wasn't a motion, you know what I mean? Like this woman has put up with me. So Tuesday I dedicated my meeting to Christine because she loved me. And Sunday I dedicated my meeting to Eddie because he was there at my first open talk when I had to tell everybody that I had drank and lied for two years about it. And he sat there in the front row and he cried with me. And at the end of it, he came up to me and said, I drank last week and I didn't want to tell anybody. So what I've learned about being honest about relapse and honest about where I am in my recovery is that I have absolutely have to tell the truth because that's how we stay sober. Like it's how we stay sober. And I don't know about everybody else and how they stay, how they stay sober or connected to God, but I know for me that I cannot live within my own skin and not get drunk and be dishonest. Like, that's what I've learned. And I think that there's, you know, if you talk to various people in AA, I've been sober for a long time, which I try to prick their brains on a regular basis, unless they say something I don't like, and then I don't go near them. But the people that I like that have been sober for a long time, they, they usually generally have one theme that they're working on at that point in time. And I don't know, maybe one day I'll get off the honesty theme. I'm not really sure. Maybe when I get comfortable with being honest.
I know that today I want to be sober and I want to be a member of AA. And today that's enough for me. Thanks for listening to me. Um, I want to thank um, the other speakers who spoke before me who maybe gave a little more of um, a uniform um, talk. I really, I really am glad to be here. Thank you again for Katya. Thank you again, Katya, for asking me to speak. Okay. Um, we have a couple minutes. I usually have something to say for everything, and I'm honestly speechless right now. Um, So if anybody else wants to take a shot at it, feel free. Um, The mic is open. We have a few minutes. If anyone has questions for the speakers um, or just wants to comment, feel free. Sure, just come on up to the mic so it can be recorded. Oh, sorry. Should have mentioned that before, shouldn't I? (sighs) Hi, I'm Megan, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Megan. And uh, this is really weird for me because I've I have never I've not given a speech like I've never talked at a meeting like you know this is I'm the speaker meeting and I'm the speaker no I've never done that before so this is a really weird position for me to be in but um, I just wanted to say that I can completely relate to just the pride and the thinking and um, you know I got sober a year ago at um, at 19. And recently, you know, I turned 20 and then I started thinking about my 21st birthday and I started, you know, I recently have had those thoughts where it's like, well, maybe, maybe it would be just okay. You know, maybe one day I won't, I won't be an AA. I'll just not drink. And like, even though I know that, um, that doesn't work for me because before I started drinking, I was crazy. Like I was, I was a dry drunk my entire high school experience, my entire middle school experience, I swear to God, I was dry drunk in preschool. But, um, and that scares me because, uh, once I turn 21, like there is nothing stopping me from getting as much booze as I want to. So, um, and the only thing sometimes that stops me is that I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would make it back to the program because I wouldn't want to pick up a white chip. Like, that pride would stop me. So I can really relate to that thinking, and I'm so glad that, like, you shared that about that. And it's it's good to hear that I'm not alone in those thoughts because I know they're crazy. I just don't know. Like, and I know if I stay around long enough, they'll stop because it happens every time. But sometimes it – sometimes I still get scared. So thanks for letting me share. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.